your Bibles this morning, Matthew chapter number 21. Matthew chapter number 21, we're looking at a parable here that the Lord spoke. His audience is uh, the disciples and the elders and chief priests of the synagogue. And he is directing this parable toward the elders and chief priests of the synagogue. These folks have an opportunity to hear Christ, accept Christ, and live for the Lord. They have an opportunity to be saved and changed and their lives rearranged for the glory of God. But they miss it. They miss their chance. And we come to this passage of Scripture and we want to learn from the truth that God gives us. And we want to take advantage today of the opportunity that God has given us. The opportunity that God has given us is that we have life. I'm looking around, as far as I know, everybody I see is alive. And I'm thankful. May our lives and the breath in our lungs and the beating heart in our chest remind us this morning that God has extended his mercy one more day to me. And God has given me another opportunity to put him on the throne of my heart and make him the king and lord of my life. I am so thankful for the opportunity that God's given us today. Look with me in God's word, Matthew chapter number 21. We'll begin reading in verse number 33. The Bible says, Here in another parable, there was a certain householder which planted a vineyard and hedged it round about and digged a wine press in it and built a tower and let it out to husbandmen and went into a far country. And when the time of the fruit drew near, he sent his servants to the husbandmen that they might receive the fruits of it. And the husbandmen took his servants and beat one and killed another and stoned another. Again, he sent other servants, more than the first, and they did unto them likewise. But last of all, he sent unto them his son, saying, They will reverence my son. But when the husbandmen saw the son, they said among themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him, and let us seize on his inheritance. And they caught him and cast him out of the vineyard and slew him. When the Lord thereof of the vineyard cometh, what will he do unto those husbandmen? They say unto him, He will miserably destroy those wicked men, and will let out his vineyard unto other husbandmen, which shall render him the fruits in their seasons. Jesus saith unto them, Did ye never read in the scripture? The stone which the builders rejected, the same has become the head of the corner. This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore, say I unto you, The kingdom of God shall be taken from you, and given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. And whosoever shall fall on this stone shall be broken. But on whomsoever it shall fall, it will grind him to powder. And when the chief priests and Pharisees had heard his parables, they perceived that he spake of them. But when they sought to lay hands on him, they feared the multitude because they took him for a prophet. Look with me in verse 43. Jesus looking at the chief priests and elders, the leaders of the Jewish religion at that time. He says this, Therefore say I unto you, The kingdom of God shall be taken from you. The kingdom of God shall be taken from you. From you. Now, I want to remind you, as we look at these parables, there are some really strong things said here. One of which is, Jesus looks at these men and says, The kingdom of God shall be taken from you. In just a moment, he'll say, Have you not, Do you not remember what was said? The stone that the builders rejected has become the chief of the corner. Jesus will also look at these men and say, Whoever falls on that stone will be broken, but on whomsoever that stone falls on, he'll be, the Cody Sturgill version, obliterated, ground into powder. (laughs) Jesus says some pretty strong things, doesn't he? And he is directing his comments right at the scribes and the chief elders of the synagogue, the leaders of the Jewish religion. 
I want to remind you of this when Jesus uses very strong words and strong language. Even language that is rich in condemnation. Jesus doesn't speak with hate, glad that these Pharisees will be pounded into sand. Jesus speaks with warning and love and concern and a broken heart and a quiver in his voice because his burden is that these men and these people and that generation will repent of their sin and turn to the Lord Jesus Christ in faith. You see, if you've ever had a meeting with a doctor where the doctor had to tell you something that you didn't want to hear, he walks in the room and he says something, God forbid, but it's happened to a lot of you. I'm sorry to tell you, but you have cancer. He doesn't tell you you have cancer because he hates you. And he's glad you have cancer. No. He tells you you have cancer because he, needs, he knows we must identify the problem and prescribe the right regimen of treatment in order that you might overcome. And on this day, as Jesus gives some really strong words to the scribes and the elders, and quite frankly, as we read God's word today, and God speaks to our hearts in words that are kind of tough, that are pointed and convicting, be reminded of this, that when God shows you your sin, when God exposes your need, he does not do that in hate. He does it in love because he wants what's best for you. Here's the statement that struck a chord in my heart and the title of our message today. Jesus looks at these men. He says, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you. The kingdom of God shall be taken from you. Just so you know the context of this scripture and the context of this statement, God had promised that and God had said that The nation of Israel were a blessed people. That the Jewish religion would be the foundation of the hope of the world. And God wanted to use his people. But the Bible says that he came unto his own and his own received him not. And the nation of Israel as a whole, the religion of the Jews as a whole, rejected their Messiah, their Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And Jesus looks at them and he says, hey, look, here's the deal. The kingdom of God shall be taken from you. Their opportunity had come and it would soon pass. Why? Because they hardened their heart and they rejected the Savior. The kingdom of God shall be taken from you. I don't know about you, but I don't like for things to be taken from me. How many of you, if I were to walk up to you and I just snatched your Bible out of your hand, you'd say, oh, okay. That gets on my nerves. You just rip something out of my hands. What are you doing? I don't like things to be taken away from me in little ways like that or in big ways. I'll just tell you, I don't like the thoughts of my home being taken away from me. You see, I bought a house and I have a mortgage. They all God's people said, amen, hallelujah. I got a mortgage. I agreed to the terms. And you know what? I'm motivated to make the house payment because I don't want the bank to take my house away. How about you? You understand? God gave me the greatest of all gifts. God gave me a family. And you know, I don't want my family taken away from me. So you know what I do? To the best of my ability, with God as my help, I try to please the Lord and put him first in my life and live a principled life so that my family is able to stay intact and my family is not taken away. I don't want things to be taken away from me. My health. I'm thankful for a measure of health and we praise the Lord for it. Look, you may not be able to tell But I'm somewhat careful about what I eat. (laughs) What are you laughing at? (laughs) 
I'm a lot more careful about what I eat in January and February than I am in November and December. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. <laughs> Why? I'm careful about what I eat because I don't want my health taken away from me. I'm careful about the routine of my life because I don't want my strength taken away. And there are certain rules and laws and agreements with nature and with this world and with in business that I tend to those things and I take care of those things because I don't want to take it away. And the Lord Jesus in this passage of Scripture, He is speaking very frankly to the leaders of the synagogue, the leaders of the Jews' religion, and He says this to them. He says, look, if you will humble yourself and you will fall on the rock that is Christ and you will allow God to work, then you can keep it. You can keep your influence. You can keep your opportunity. You can keep the privilege of being able to see your children and your grandchildren come to faith in Christ. You can see the privilege and the opportunity of God blessing you. So we come to the conclusion of this passage of Scripture. It becomes very evident that they will harden their hearts against the calling and the wooing of the Savior to put their faith in Him. And Jesus looks at these men and He says, The kingdom of God shall be taken from you. And I don't know about you, but I don't want that. I want every opportunity. I want the blessing of God, the peace of God, the fruits of the Spirit. I want every blessing that God has intended for Cody Sturgeon. I want it. As we study God's Word, we can see how we can have it. And it's not by bolstering ourselves and our self-pride. It is by humbling ourselves and becoming obedient, faithful followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. Husbandmen. In his vineyard. Look at the story. Let me just tell you, first of all, the story. Look at what the Bible says here in verse number 33. Here another parable. There was a certain householder which planted a vineyard and hedged it round about and digged a wine press in it and built a tower and let it out to husbandmen and went into a far country. So here's the painting, the picture that the Lord presents in the minds of these men. The rulers of the synagogue, the chief priests and the elders. He says, let me tell you a parable. Let me tell you a story. There was a certain householder which planted. This is the man that had all the money. He had the possession. He had the ability. And this certain man, he purchases a piece of land. And the Bible says that he planted a vineyard. He planted a vineyard. He made it just right. He knew where to plant the vineyard. He knew how far the rows should be spaced. He knew that it was in the right climate. It was in the right area. He planted a vineyard. The Bible says not only did he plant it, he hedged it round about. He put put in a hedge. He fenced it off. He did the work and made the investment so that the vineyard could thrive. He continues his efforts and the Bible says he digged a wine press in it. He made it possible that the grapes could grow. He made it possible that the place could be protected by the fence, by the hedge. He even provided the necessary equipment so that it could be productive. Now this is the householder. By the way, the householder in this passage of Scripture is God. He provided all the equipment so that this vineyard could thrive. If this was a cattle farm, it would be he provided... The corn ground and the silos and the tractors and the fencing and the every pro, everything that you possibly need to make that work, God provided it. The householder provided it. He digged a wine press in it and built a tower. Everything they needed was right there. The Bible says he let it out to husbandmen. So the story goes like this. God has provided an opportunity and built a vineyard and made it possible so that 
God's people can thrive. The scripture continues and says this. He let it out to husbandmen. It all belonged to God. The household, it all belonged to God. But God saw fit to let husbandmen work and produce and make it work, make it happen. So he said, here, I'm going to give this to you. I'm going to entrust you with this. And you just do the work. And you make the yield. And you will reap the greatest benefit. The only thing is, once a year when the fruit comes in, I'm going to come and get my portion. It was a really fair deal. I mean, the householder, God, provided everything necessary. And he said, here, it's yours. Make it work. Make it yield. Make it produce. And once a year I'll come and I'll get that which is mine. So that's exactly the term that they agreed to. And then here's what happens. The Bible says in verse number 34, When the time of the fruit drew near, he sent his servants to the husbandmen that they might receive the fruits of it. Now, the householder sends the servant, Hey, the boss said it's time for you to pay up. It was a fair amount. It was not ridiculous. It was according to the law. It was right. It's time for them to make their payment. The servant came. The Bible says in verse 35 that the husbandman took his servants, God's servants, and beat one and killed another and stoned another. Do what? Yeah, they said, we're not sharing. They got selfish. They got full of themselves and their pride. We're not sharing. And the Bible says that the householder, God, again, verse 36, sent other servants more than the first. And they did unto them likewise. What did they do to them? They beat them, stoned them, killed them. But last, verse 37, but last of all, he sent unto them his son, saying, They will reverence my son. So the householder sends his own son. They'll reverence my son. They see the son coming. The Bible says in verse 38, When the husband saw the son, they said among themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him and let us seize on his inheritance. What do they think? The story that Jesus is telling says, hey, look, they saw his son. They said, aha, we'll kill him too. And if we kill him, then we'll get his inheritance. And we won't ever have to worry about this householder ever again. And they caught him, verse 39, and cast him out of the vineyard and slew him. Now, here's what you remember. I'm painting the picture with a long introduction for a very short message. Here's what I want you to remember. Jesus is looking at the leaders of the synagogue. The very people that have been entrusted to lead the nation of Israel, the Jews' religion, to lead them in faith, believing in the Messiah that he was, that God had sent. And Jesus tells this story. He says, now listen, guys, let me tell you a story. There was this householder who bought a vineyard. He bought the vineyard, and he did everything necessary to make that vineyard Thrive and profit. I mean, he went all out. A wine press, a tower, the whole shooting match. And he lent it out, and they rented it, and they began to work it. And the time came for him to come and collect the rent. When he, came, when he sent his servant to collect the rent, the first three servants, they beat one, killed one, and stoned another. Jesus is telling this story to them. He said, and he sent more, the same thing. And they did the same thing. As far as we know, at least six servants were beaten or murdered. And so Jesus is telling this story to these guys. And he says, and I'll tell you, it gets worse than that. The same guy sent, the same householder sent his own son. He thought, well, if I send my own son, surely they'll reverence him. He sent his own son. He said, he said, I, he said that guy sent his own son. And when they saw the son, they thought, aha, we'll kill him too, and it'll all be ours. So at that point, after Jesus tells the story to these men, he just looks at him and he says, tell me something. What do you think the householder will do? What do you think the householder will do? Well, these guys, they've got into the story. 
They got to think about the story. And they are just, they can't believe the audacity of the husbandmen, the people who had rented that, that farm. They couldn't believe the audacity that they would do that to somebody that was so good to them. And the chief priests and elders, Jesus says in verse number 40, he looks at him and he says, When the Lord therefore of the vineyard comes, cometh, what will he do unto those husbandmen? Man, it's almost like they don't take, they even take a breath. Verse 41, they say unto him, He will miserably destroy those wicked men and will let out his vineyard unto other husbandmen, which shall render him the fruits in their seasons. Here's, here they say, Jesus asks the question, and they look back and say, well, I'll tell you what he'll do. He will miserably destroy them. Hmm. They condemned themselves. They condemned themselves. They said, God's not going to put up with that. That household is not going to put up with that. And so Jesus, after he paints this picture, and they condemn themselves, here's how Jesus presents it. Jesus says in verse 42, Did ye never read in the Scriptures? The stone which the builders rejected, the same has become the head of the corner. This is the Lord's doing and is marvelous in our eyes. Jesus goes to the book of Isaiah and he says, Hey, look, your Bible says that people just like you are going to reject the chief cornerstone. And that stone will be the stone that the whole thing is built on. You see, Jesus was standing there. He is that stone. Jesus was talking about himself. And Jesus was looking at those men and he said, he said, Look, the Bible's prophesied that you will reject the chief cornerstone. And I believe that each individual there had an opportunity to stop their rejection and to humble themselves and put their faith and trust in the rock of ages, which was Christ. They had a chance to submit. The Bible says in verse 44, Whosoever shall fall on this stone shall be broken. What's that mean? I'll just tell you, it's so plain. Do you know that if you fall to your knees and fall on your face before God, God breaks our spirit. It's not a bad thing. You know, I've got a sinful spirit. There are things in my heart that I want to do that are wrong. But when I humble myself and I fall on the rock, which is Christ, my sinful, self-destructing spirit, it's broken. And I'll just have you know something. Some of the greatest fruit and benefit in the life of Cody Sturgill has come out of seasons where I've been broken in submission to the Lord. And I've said, you know what? I'm not going to rebel against God anymore. I don't understand everything about it, but I'm not going to rebel against God anymore. And I'm going to fall on the rock. And it's not what I want in my flesh right this minute, but I'm going to trust God with the results. Falling on the rock, it'll break your spirit, but a broken spirit is something that God can bless. It's something that God can give peace and joy and hope and a bright future. A broken spirit is good. You see, folks, you can either fall on the rock and be broken and let the great physician heal you. The alternative is awful. Look what the Bible says in verse number 44. Whosoever shall fall on this stone shall be broken. But on whomsoever it shall fall, it will grind him to powder. What happened? Look, here's the word. You can either build on the rock, which is Jesus, or you can break under it. You see, we can't rebel against God and expect God to bless us. We can't turn our back on the Creator and expect creation to somehow give us peace and joy. We must worship the Creator. We must humble ourselves. We must fall on the rock. When we fall on the rock, our spirits are broken, but we're renewed to strength and righteousness and what is good and right and perfect. When we harden ourselves against Jesus, we break ourselves. Look, folks, sin in every form hurts you. It may feel good for a season, 
hey, look, it will feel good for a season. It may feel invigorating and freeing. But don't be fooled by the temporary pleasure of sin. Because if you break, if you do not fall on the rock and break your spirit and live for Christ, you'll destroy yourself with the penalty of sin. The Bible says in verse 45, When the chief priests and Pharisees had heard his parables, they perceived that he spake of them. But when they sought to lay hands on him, they feared the multitude because they took him for a prophet. What did these guys do? They heard this message. They realized it was about them. What did they do? Yes, Lord. No, no. They said, I'll kill him. We'll kill him. In the book of Mark, this same story the Bible tells us that this group of people, the chief priests and elders and the Pharisees, after they heard the story, they knew it was about them, they were given the opportunity to repent. The Bible says they went their own way. I'll tell you what, we make a terrible mistake when we go our own way as opposed to the Lord's way. How many of you faithful Christians here this morning would testify to seasons that you've gone your own way and you regret it. If that's you, would you raise your hand? It's wonderful. I regret every day that I've ever lived my own way. How many of you faithful Christians this morning can testify to seasons in your life where you didn't understand exactly and it was hard and you fell on the rock and you put your trust in Christ and it broke your spirit but you are so thankful for the result of God's grace and mercy. How many of you have ever fallen on the rock and been broken and had to change your mind and cha- repent of your sin, but you rejoice in the faithfulness of God? How many of you are like that this morning? Me too. Me too. And I want you to know, Jesus, I can't help but think there was probably a tear in his eye as he looked at these men. He said, look, fall on the rock and be broken. Be broken to new life. Be broken to renewed hope. Be be broken to what is right and what will actually provide for you joy and peace and everything you really want. Fall on him and be broken. Or reject him and be crushed. He looks at these men. He says, the kingdom of God shall be taken away from you. Do what? Yeah. He says, look, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you. Jesus hadn't gone to the cross yet. Jesus hadn't been buried in a barred tomb yet. Jesus hadn't risen from the dead yet. These guys, they were still alive. And they had a chance. And God says to them, hey, the kingdom of God shall be taken away from you. But it's not over yet because you can still fall on the rock. How does this apply to Israel? Israel lost its opportunity. Israel will rise again after the rapture. God will use his chosen people. But Israel missed their chance. The big question is how does this apply to me? How does this apply to you? Here it is. God has provided a vineyard. He's made everything possible. He's provided everything necessary for you to have the yearnings and the desires of your heart. He's made it possible that you can thrive. He's made it possible that you can provide. He's made it possible that you can have a smile on your face and skip in your step and joy in your heart, peace with man and God. He's made it possible. He's provided everything. But you must submit to his authority as God. You must give him first place. You must not be so selfish that you want to take God's place in your own life. What did those, what did those husbandmen, the people who would rented the farm, what did they do? They took the place of the owner. 
What was Jesus picturing? He said these people have decided they wanted to be God. And I'll just let you know something. If you're here today and you're living in rebellion to the word of God, the truth of God, and you've not given Jesus proper place in your heart, you're not saved, or you are saved and you're living in rebellion, I'll just let you know something. Do you know what you're doing? You declared yourself God. And God a fool. And I'll have you know something. You'll never declare God a fool and not suffer the consequences. Jesus with a tenderness and a burden, he says, please, the kingdom of heaven will be taken away from you. Fall on the rock. Let it break your spirit. But let God provide everything that you could ever want. That's how it applies to me. That's how it applies to you. We're God's children. We are God's husbandmen. We are God's servants. That's good. If you'll allow the principles of God's word to rule in your heart and life, you know what God's going to do? He's going to bless you. He's going to bless you. You know what obeying and honoring the word of God does? (laughs) It does some interesting things. It'll help you keep some things that are important. You know what faithful Christian people do? They pay their bills. And get to stay in their homes. You know what faithful Christian husbands do? They love their wives. You know what faithful Christian wives do? They love their husbands. And God blesses their families. Hey, look, if you yield yourself to the Lord, not only will you be able to keep your soul... <laughs> But you'll be able to keep everything else that's precious. It won't be snatched away. Here's the glory of it. Jesus on this day stood and looked at these men. He said, hey, here's the truth. Fall on the rock, you have a chance. You got opportunity. They could have repented. I can't help but think that maybe one or two of them did. Here's the glory. You're here today. You may have spent the last six months in rebellion. You're here today. Fall on the rock. Trust him. And keep the glory and blessing of God. You may be here today and you've rebelled against God for years and years. Here's my message to you. It's not mine. It's God's message to you. Fall on the rock. Trust God. Make him first. Confess your sins, repent, and turn from your wicked ways and live for Jesus. Fall on the rock. Sure, it'll break your spirit. It'll change the way you've been doing things, but I'll just tell you something. It'll change it for the glory of God. No matter how long or how short, you may have just rebelled against God in the last few hours. Here's the good news. If you have breath in your lungs and a beat in your heart, you have an opportunity today to fall on the rock and receive that glory that only God can give. That blessing that only God can give. And it cannot and doesn't have to be said, and it won't be said of you, the kingdom of God was taken from them. We get the opportunity to glory in the kingdom and blessing of God as God's people when we make him our Lord. I don't want that taken away from me. How about you? I want what God has because God loves me and he wants what's best. God loved those men. He wanted what's best for them. And he said, hey, here, here's what you need to do. Fall on the rock. Humble yourselves. Bow before God. Repent of your sin. Trust Christ.